historically and, and really prehistorically, fires have behaved differently than they're behaving today. And that's primarily due to the fact that there is way more fuel around. And partially because that fuel can get drier with our longer fire seasons, where there's a longer period of drying before we get rain again. Fuel was more discontinuous. And by discontinuous, I mean it was more patchy and broken up. And by fuel, I mean anything green or on the ground here that is wood, uh, fire considers fuel. It doesn't really care if it's live or dead. The only reason that live fuel doesn't burn as much as dead fuel is because there's more water in it. So the more water you have in the fuel, the less the, the fire can spread. And the, the more space there is between the pieces of fuel, um, the harder it is for one piece of fuel, once it, is, it does start to burn, to transfer that heat to the next piece of fuel and start to turn that piece of fuel into gas. So by discontinuity, I mean those gaps between the fuels re are really important for determining how fast and how far um, a fire can spread and how much heat can, it can generate all at once in a single burn period. And that happens at all scales. Like for example, the place I'm standing right here has a bunch of bare rock and bare dirt mineral soil uh, with a little bit of grass, not a lot of fuel there. But closer to the trees right over here, there's a whole bunch of pine cones and dead wood and fire could easily propagate itself around that patch and through that patch till it got to a place where there wasn't any fuel left. In the Sierra and when things are very dry, the live fuel gets a lot closer to the dead fuel in terms of the amount of moisture. There's still a lot more water in it, but imagine a forest where all the canopies are interconnected and interlocking. All those trees have been sitting out in the wind and the dryness uh, all summer long for three, four, five months without any rain whatsoever, drying out. And all the fuel under it is dead and super kiln dried as well. And all of it is just ready and ripe for burning without much water to put a break on the, that conversion into gas and the conversion of a bunch of that gas into the heat and the energy that can drive even more wind. So if you are in a flat spot and a whole bunch of all of that fuel consumes all at once and all that heat rises and it sucks air in underneath it. And that indraft is one of the ways that a fire can create its own wind, even if there isn't a whole bunch of the ambient wind um, to drive it. So in a flat spot, um, that doesn't work out to much fire spread because the wind can come from all directions. But on an incline, like where the King Fire started, when you have that interlocking canopy and everything that can all flash into fire at once, it's much easier for the wind to come in from the downhill side than the uphill side because heat rises in that, and that downhill side is where the air can come in uh, much easier. So one side is blocked and the other side isn't and you get that upslope wind driven by fire. That upslope wind can get really, really big at the fire line. It can be 40, 50 miles an hour at a fire line even if there's no ambient wind. And that's the kind of wind, fuel driven wind event that it appears the, the King Fire created. Even further, there was a kind of a V-shaped drainage there. And that Rubicon drainage funneled that wind even further to create even more intensity for the wind on the fire line. And that was able to spread it much faster. So all of those factors combined with fuel and combined with the fact that on that day, that atmospheric instability and the ability of an air parcel to, to release all of the heat all the way to the freezing point also creates instability and even more wind has to come in to replace all that air. So all of that fire-driven, wind-driven um, behavior starts with really dry fuel being continuous and accessible and to immediately flash at large scales um, and create the kind of mega fire behavior that we saw in the King Fire. As California's climate warms, fire seasons are getting longer. And when it comes to the threat of high severity wildfire, the communities and the forests in the Sierra Nevada are in a really precarious state. When our forests are healthy, fires often are a really good thing. But when so many of our forests in the Sierra Nevada are overcrowded and filled with dead and dying trees, the fires can burn so hot that they create gale force winds. And that often turns into a cycle of fast moving, high severity, really damaging wildfires. In the King Fire, the blaze burned more than 50,000 acres in just one day. And the Rubicon Canyon today still bears witness to how hot it burned. You can look from ridgeline to ridgeline across the burn scar, and in some places, not a single live tree still stands. 
These trees released millions of metric tons of greenhouse gases as they burned, and more will be released as they decay or burn in another wildfire. Restoring resilience by removing fuel from our overcrowded Sierra Nevada forests is a cornerstone of the Sierra Nevada Watershed Improvement Program. It's essential that we safeguard these forests for all Californians, especially if we want to safeguard the carbon stock that they store.